you can see, I got a big hamburger here from Burger King and some onion rings, some fries, and a couple of apple turnovers and a cherry cola. Haven't had a cherry cola from Burger King before. So I got a, a big Whopper and a big Whopper of a story to tell you. But first, I got some shout outs. Jimmy McAvoy, big shout out to you, my friend. Randy Castro and Matix Espinoa. So I hope I pronounced your names right. A uh, big shout out to all three of you and a big shout out to the rest of you people as well. So I'm going to dig in because I'm starving. That's so good. So I want to take it back to 1975. lived but only from Monday to Friday it was a five-day camp but some people lived there they had houses there or mobile homes or whatever they lived there permanently and Tony and Leslie lived there permanently uh, so Leslie was always saying that you know I can get you a job and you know if you come up there and so there's lots of work there no he always kind of sort of talked like a big shot but he was a very nice man I really liked him my, my family liked him but he did like to kind of, you know, act like a big shot. So I thought, well, maybe I'll call his bluff. Maybe I'll go up there and see if I can get work. So he said, if you do that, you can stay at our place. So I went up there. Got there early July. stayed at their place and uh, the first day I went to the personnel office and I, uh, I, I applied for a job and they said well we're definitely looking for people um, you, you could start off setting jokers I didn't know what setting jokers was I kind of had explained to me but I knew it was kind of rough work but I didn't really understand it that much but I just wanted to work This logging camp was a town called Port Alberni, which is 30 miles by logging road. Very rough road. And Port Alberni is about an hour and a half from where I live. Or a little bit less than that, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. But I used to hitchhike back and forth all the time. So my parents drove me up there. They dropped me off. I stayed at Leslie and Tony's place. Like I said, the first day I went to the first hour office, the guy said, well, come back later tonight, we'll see if we have something. So I went there at about 4.30, and he said, well, no, but maybe tomorrow. So I went there in the morning, and uh, he says, well, no, maybe tonight. 
so he says come back at about 4 30 like you did yesterday so i did went back there at 4 30 sure enough he says you can start tomorrow here's what you need to get so he gave me a list of things i need to get i need to get some cork boots now cork boots are a, a, a type of boot they're specifically designed for logging they've got little spikes like little cleats sticking out the bottom and you can replace them you can buy a little key and unscrew them and put new ones in because they do wear down to little nubs if they break off or whatever but you cannot go logging without those type of boots so this logging camp had a lot of bunk houses it had a gas station it um, had a little commissary like a little store where you could buy things or have a meal or buy all your cigarettes or magazines or you know logging clothing or whatever you needed so i had to get some boots i bought my cork boots for um fifty dollars nowadays the cheapest ones are 300 you can spend as much as 700 or more on steel toed leather cork boots crazy so um i was supposed to start my job i think it was um well, well the next day i guess like after the third day of being there and uh, i was assigned to bunkhouse so i went to bunkhouse number one and the guy that was living there uh, he wasn't used to having a room party he hadn't had one before and his name was hans he was a nice guy but he uh, even though he worked in the logging camp and he had done some logging jobs he was working in personnel so he was doing basically more light duty stuff so um uh, I could tell he wasn't crazy about having a room partner, but I said, well, I think it's just temporary. He says, well, yeah, probably, you know, but he was a nice guy. We got on well, but didn't have a lot in common, so we were just kind of played to one another. So anyways, at least I had a, I was in the bunkhouses. Now the bunkhouses, they had eight rooms, two people per room, so that's 16 people per bunkhouse. Now you have a room here and a room here but you share a bathroom and the average bunkhouse size room could be, be about the size of your average primary bedroom in your house you know got a single bed at one end single bed at the other a little sink you got some closets a little table a dresser you know and like i said you share a bathroom with the people in the next room not a big deal could have a bite I got a job. Now, they had lots of bunkhouses, and these are all old. They were probably built back in the 40s. I was there in the 70s, and these bunkhouses were already old. They had like the old radiator heat, uh, heating type thing. Wooden windows, you know, uh, just, just old. Old tile floors, but they were warm in the winter. That was fine. Yeah. And there was a big cookhouse, like a canvas cafeteria style cookhouse go there with your tray just line up the food was amazing you just go along with your tray and they just you know put on whatever you want you know it was um, um you know cutlets pork fish steak whatever uh, they had hamburgers every night and that's kind of the reason i'm having hamburger now was every night they had hamburgers no matter what was on the menu they always had hamburgers for people that didn't want to eat you know the pork or the chicken or whatever they could always have a hamburger but it's funny because you see some guys go up there with a tray they come back they got two hamburgers plus the pork and the chicken or whatever else right or the beef stew people ate like kings tuesday night was steak night my record was three t-bones i only did that once just to see if i could Sleep that well. 
call that night um, because I was very nervous about my job, you know. And um, but I thought, why well, can't I make the best of it? You know, not living in a logging camp is uh, it's an adjustment. Uh, they had a beautiful swimming pool they just built, so there's that, you know. Uh, but there wasn't a whole lot to do. And the one thing, you know, I, I had a neighbor once who was a next Navy man. He said, when you join the Navy, if you don't know how to drink, you'll s soon learn how. What's well, like that in a logging camp? There wasn't a lot to do except smoke pot and drink booze and, and listen to music. starting wage was going to be seven thirty four an hour. It seems like chicken feed, but back then you could buy a brand new Corvette for $7,000 or a brand new um, Ford Dodge or a Chevy 4x4 for the same amount of money. You could buy a brand new house for thirty-five dollars or $40,000. Most houses back then were about thirty. yard early morning because it's July it's already light out thank God um, starting time we had to be at the marshalling yard by I think quarter to seven you have to drive to your site which would take anywhere from half hour or longer so I go into the uh, the building there I was told to ask for a guy named L I won't say his last name even though I remember it I, I'll just use his first name So he says, okay, um, 
See that guy over there? His name's Earl. You go talk to him. Earl was the foreman. There was a lot of foremen. There were several, but there was, a, there was one general foreman. And a lot of foremen. And Earl was just one of the, the sub foremen. right over there. And they'll take you to where you need to go. Now, I had my locking boots. I had a shirt very much like this. I had these locking pants, which are very baggy, very loose, and they never touch the ground. They're always about four inches above your shoe. And that's so they don't trip over or whatever, or that they don't get tangled up and stuff. So they're very funny looking pants, and you have suspenders used to hold them up. chatter back and forth and get the odd comment and yeah you know, where are you from and who you working with and blah blah blah. I hear one guy said uh, he probably won't last the day. I wouldn't mind having those boots, you know, stuff like that. So I'm thinking, well this is gonna be hell. So we drive and drive and drive and we're going up this this mountain. So these switchbacks like this, back and forth. You drive this way, drive that way. That's really the only way to get up because you can't drive straight up, you can't do it. So you have to do these switchbacks like that. And of course, that's the only way that the big trucks can get up there and come down as well. You couldn't possibly drive straight up or come straight down, you couldn't do it. So we finally get to the top. I have no idea, I'm completely green, I don't know anything about logging. First thing I see is a great big machine there. Of course, it's red and white like everything else. And there's another machine that looks like a, like a loader type thing parked beside it. And there's a logging truck sitting there. And I get out. And the foreman, Earl, is already up there. He drove up in his pickup truck. And I hear him talking to somebody. And then um, he comes up and he says, okay, this is Ron. He's the rig and slinger. He's in charge of this operation. You do everything he tells you to do. I said, okay. So there was the operator who operated the machine. There was the guy who operated the loader, who loaded the logs onto the truck. There was me and three other chokermen, so there's four of us, and then the rigging slinger, which was Ron. That's good Jerry call. Now there's lots of ways to log, but just this one way, oh, I won't go into too many different uh, variations, but this way, the way we were logging that day, you have like the big the big machine and a big back spar. You got the, the main line, the main line and the haul back. And you got this big, uh, like a carriage, a big uh, series of, of pulleys on, on a big block that goes along the, the line. And uh, hanging from that are some chokers, like like cables, long cables. And they got a knob on the end, and this is what they call a bell, which slides up and down. So you can loop it around and set it. You can set the, the knob in the bell, and it's like a loop, like a choker, it chokes, right? Like you would choke off a log, right? So um, the rigging slinger, Ron, side hill and the 
there's logs everywhere. It's been completely clear cut. There are logs everywhere and huge. I mean, my table here is probably four feet diameter. The smallest log was probably four feet in diameter. I mean, and the butt end of them are sometimes, you know, six or seven feet. They, they were big cedar, like huge logs, not little poles. I mean, huge logs. And there's brambles and bark and branches and, and undergrowth and, and, you know, slash and you name it, and smaller logs and everything else. So it's not like a walk in the park. You're dripping constantly. You're up to your knees, you're up to your waist and all this brush and everything. So anyways, this big carriage comes down and all these chokers are hanging from it. So the ring slinger, he says, okay, you come with me. So he says, okay, grab that choker. So all of us grab a choker. And it, uh, he's blowing these whistles to signal the operator. There's a series of whistles that signal the operator because they can't always see each other and they're a long ways away. And that's really the best and safest way to communicate is to blow whistles. You know, shorts and longs and a combination of that sort of thing.
I'm getting screamed at and yelled at and swore at. I don't like this kind of work. It's hard. I'm getting all scraped up and cut up and you know, like cedar, cedar logs. You get that cedar all over you, and itchy and all scratched, scratched and scraped up. And it's hard work. Like I mean, after the first turn, I was exhausted fighting with that cable. And then trying to run out of there, like I said, you're almost up to your waist in brambles and you just can't move, right? So we kept that up. We got a coffee break and then get lunch and then get another break. Now the only good thing, two good things, when you're up there and you look down, you suddenly notice, wow, the scenery is fantastic. You can see the water down below, way down below, you see some islands, you see a, a fish boat off in the distance. Eventually I'll see a lot of deer, black bear, owls, you know, stuff like that. A lot of eagles. But that was the, the one good thing. Another good thing is between each turn, you got a chance to rest. You got a chance to catch your breath. Praise the Lord for that. So at the end of the day, I was just beat. I was, I was beat emotionally, beat physically. I just thought, and I don't think I can do this. So I can do the, the grumpy thing. Go back down to the camp. I go into the uh, the cookhouse. I'm sitting there by myself. I hear, I hear somebody say, hey, Mark. I look up. It's my, my friend Mike from high school. I say, hey, Mike, how are you? Good. He said, I, I said, I didn't know you worked here. He said, yeah, I started working here last February. I dropped my last semester and started working here. I said, you know, Paul's working here. Daryl's working here. Um, Jay's working here. All these people I knew, I couldn't believe it. So that kind of gave me some encouragement. I thought, well, at least I got some friends here, you know. So I, I felt a bit better knowing that I, I knew some people in camp. So the next day was pretty much the same. a short week because there was a holiday in there it was um, Canada today is July 1st so we had uh, a short week so after my first week I remember when I went home I had to three days off I remember saying to my parents I don't think I can go back God it was just a nightmare and I remember my mom and dad saying well just you know, give it your best. Just try. So I didn't want to go back, but I did. So I've gone to camp. Well, I got to Port Alberni Sunday night. You go to this taxi cab office, and at 7 o'clock the cab leaves to go to camp. That's like I said, 30 mile by, by logging road, really rough road. And like I said, they only charge you $1.75 because a company picks up the rest. So. You'd always get to know people in the cab, you know, because you mean, you know, you're sitting there for 30 miles, you know, you start talking, get to know people. Met this guy named Danny, very nice man. Turns out we share a birthday. He just started working there too. So the next day, get up, go to work. Same. And um, same people, but there's a different rigging slinger. Uh, Ron's not there. He's, I guess, he's off sick or something. And 
there's some other guy there. Can't remember his name. Because we only worked together, you know, that one week. But he was much different. He was very laid back. Very relaxed, you know. You know, he just does that. Okay, you can grab that one over there. sweat the small stuff, this kind of thing, you know, he was a lot different, so that made me relax more, and I remember when I went and set my joker, and he goes, hey, good job, like that, gives me a thumbs up, so that kind of boosted my confidence, so that week went much better, by the end of that week, I felt so much better about the, the work, I was understanding it more, I didn't feel so pressured, I was starting to make friends, I was, you know, getting to know people, uh, you know, uh, on the job, you know, and part of my crew was getting all my crew members, you know, and this sort of thing. I was starting to feel like I'd, I'd been there a while. So the next week when Ron comes back, uh, I mean, we got the job site and there's Ron. so nice when he wasn't there last week, but he's back, so I thought, oh shit. So, we start working, it sends me down. Now I have to say that the first couple weeks I was there, the, the weather was kind of iffy. Some days it was kind of rainy and overcast and cloudy. Some days it was sunny, but today was a beautiful day. I remember it was, it was just, the, the weather was just fantastic. I was feeling much better. So we go down there, Ron starts blowing the whistles, you know, the rigging starts coming down. So I said, okay, you grab that log, and so-and-so grab that log. So I run over, great big huge cedar, just shove my choke underneath, you know, set it, and I run out of there. I'm the first one out of the turn. And I remember I could see Ron standing there watching, kind of give me, looking at me on the corner of his eye, like, holy cow, this guy's already improved, you know. And that made me feel kind of good. Oddly enough, my friends, as much as I didn't like Ron, the first few weeks, him and I became very good friends. And I still chat with him today on Facebook. He's well into his 70s. His health isn't that good. But he lives in Port Alberni. And we still chat on Facebook. Like I said, we got to be very good friends. We carpool together. We uh, party together. shut down because there's no market. 
the Japanese and the Chinese and the, the Saudis and people like that, you know, were our biggest customers. Japanese used to buy a lot of wood. And if the market is kind of a little bit low, the wood's not moving, then you get laid off for a week or so and everything straightens out. So I had insurance, unemployment insurance claim that is kept kind of going like a retainer type thing. So if I was laid off for a week, I could claim that and get a check. So that was nice. Now, I'm not sure if I mentioned that when you live in camp, they only charge you $225 um, a day. I think I did mention that, which really was a joke because like I said, I, I lived like a king when I was there. No shortage of hot water. It felt so good to come in at the end of the day and dry your clothes off. That was one of the worst things about um, working on the bush is the rain. Pacific Northwest, it just rains and rains and rains. You have to have rain gear. And that just weighs it down even more. It hampers your visibility. the days turned to weeks, weeks turned to months. Now it's no longer 1975, we're in early 1976. Now one thing about working up there on the side hill, and you move around to different side hills, once you completely lock that, that hill out, you go into another area. So I'd already moved around a bit by then. enjoying the money, uh, spending it like crazy, you know, I had my, uh, my Pioneer sound system, you know, I had a leather jacket, and I had, I went from having no records to like a hundred records, you know, I just, I was just fretting my money away, so much fun, bought a car, you know, so, we're now into the spring of 1976. rooming with hands. That lasted about two months and he went to personnel and said, you know, Mark's a great guy, but I'm not used to having a roommate. And they said, yeah, no problem. Because he worked in, uh, in you know, the, uh, well, the personnel himself, they kind of gave him priority. So they put me in bunk house number two. And my room partner was Tony. Guy, same age as me. We got along great. He'd be my roommate for the whole time I was there. He had a girlfriend. At one point, he got engaged. He got married at the age of 19. He's still married to this day. I'm still in contact with him on Facebook as well. So, so anyways, I got a new room partner. It's party time all the time, you know. Lots of friends coming over, you know. There was always, uh, if we weren't in our bunkhouse, we are in somebody else's bunkhouse, but, you know, it, it was great. Um, coming to camp on a Sunday night, you know, the booze would just flow, the, you know, everyone smoking pot, drinking booze, and that's, that's just, that was just the culture, that's what we did. I've been there now for about eight months. And one day, I'm going to work. I'm in the Marston yard. I'm talking to a few guys, and they, um, I see the foreman. Not Earl, but a different guy. And he's over there talking to some people. 
that comes over and he's, he asked one of the guys beside me, where are you working today? He said, I'm on 219. And he says, okay. Then he uh, asked me, where are you at? And I said, I'm on uh, 219 as well. And he goes, okay. He kind of stands. He says, okay, will you come with me? I thought, oh, darn, now where am I going? We get in this pickup truck. I said, which hell are we going to? It's a built by a company named Medill. It's a big steel A-frame, 110 feet tall, or 120, I can't remember, something like that. It doesn't matter. And it's got this rigging on, and it lifts the load, the whole entire load, off the truck, and puts it in the water, and there, that's where the boom boats deal with it. That's where they sort it all out. But for that wood to get in the water, this uh, machine with all the rigging has to lift it up. To do that, my job was comes in, the operator blows a whistle, one to stop, two to back up, three to go forward. So he blows a whistle, truck driver gets out, and the foreman show me what to do. And what you do is you go in there, just like just like the chokers, same type of thing, but it's bigger cables, like really thick. And the bell weighs probably 100 pounds, a great big thing, but you take, the raking comes down on one side of the truck, you take it underneath the this bell and then the, the machine the operator will lift it up just about two feet off the truck and then you have these these bands about that wide and just like metal banding and you hook that onto another part of the rigging he pulls that over and then you take these tin snips and snip it off and you have these uh, little aluminum uh, clips and you uh, you take one end of the band the other end of the band like and then you crimp it with an air gun, bang, 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 about three times. And that that band will hold that log, that whole uh, logging truck load together. So when it's lifted up under the water, those bands will keep it in a bundle. So that's really all I had to do. Very way easier than setting chokers. Was, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I thought people get paid to do this. So I, I did that. It didn't take me long to catch on. It wasn't hard. Just like one truck after another. Now, the operator's name, like I said, his name was John. Kind of grumpy at first. Took him a few weeks to warm up to me. But um, I got to know a lot of the truck drivers. Some of them kind of gave me a hard time at first. You know, this one guy. 
guy's name is Rory. His last name was Cooper. They uh, always called him the Coop. He used to give me a hard time. Eventually, him and I become very good friends. And once again, we still communicate on Facebook. These guys are a bit older than me. These guys are all in their 70s now. A lot of them have passed away. Some of them died young. But, you know, it's amazing how many are still around. And we still stay in touch. So, it was a very easy job. Like I said, the logging truck comes in. Throw the bands around, crimp the bands. Lifts it up, dumps it in the water, boom, boom, just take it away. There was times it was so slack, I would have half an hour between each truck. It was crazy. But then you get two or three at the same time. Sometimes it'd be one, one truck after another all day, which I preferred because the time went faster. But I got to hold all the truck drivers were all very nice guys. I'll tell you, nobody squawked more than they did. They used to complain about everything. If one of the foremen complained to one of the truck drivers about the way they were working or whatever, they'd all just slow right down. It was crazy. So the advantage was, what would happen is, when the trucks came in and once the, the load is taken off the truck, would have to load the trailer onto the back of the truck. Easy enough to do, you just pull the pin. You know, that separates the trailer from the uh, the truck. The same uh, rigging that lifts the, lo the logs into the water would pick up the trailer and put it on the truck. You know, the truck would back up, you know, two whistles to back up, drop it on, let go, three whistles go forward, you just take off. So one day, um, one of the truck drivers said, you know, have you ever thought about driving a truck? And I said, uh, no. He said, well, it's easy. Excuse me. Why? It's not easy. I mean, bringing down a load is not easy. But, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. But just, just driving the truck, you know, forward and back is a piece of cake. So, this is I'll show you. So he gets in the passenger side and I, the passenger side, and I get in the, the, the driver's side. And I think, oh my gosh, great big steering wheel, all these gauges everywhere. This was a, I think this was a Hayes truck. They mostly had Hayes and Pacific. But it was a Hayes truck, I think. Really nice truck. It was an eight speed automatic lockup. So he says, just, you know, do this, that, you know. And I just start driving ahead, which was easy, you know, it turned real nice, shifted, backed it up, you know, went forward, parked beside the machine, and behind the machine, I got out and said, hey, thanks for the lesson, that was great. So, I used to do that a lot, I would say to the truck driver, hey, uh, hey Gary, do you mind if I uh, load your trailer for you? And say, sure, okay, no problem, so I do that, I'd climb in, you know. John would blow the whistles, I'd back up to load the trailer, I'd go for it, and I'd go park it for him to get in, just take off. So this one time, this one guy, his name was Terry. He's a very nice man, he's passed away now. I'll never forget. I said, would you mind if I load your trailer for you? And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? And I said, I can I, I do this for the other drivers, can I load your trailer? He goes, well, if you want. So I get in, you know. The whistles go, I back up, blow the trailer, whistles go, I take off, go down, turn around, pull up, you know, put the brake on, get out. I'll never forget the look on his face. He was just like an awe, right? You couldn't believe it. I guess he must have thought I caught on pretty quick. So, the time came when they said, you know, you can get trained to be a truck driver. You probably won't get any hours, but... You can get trained. If that's what you want to do, they, can, they will train you. But don't expect to get a lot of hours. I mean, there's people that work there with 25 years. There was a guy that was 
because I've been working on the dump for a while, so I had about a year. So, they started training me on driving the truck. Now, it's one thing to drive a truck around a parking lot or whatever, or a little dirt road. But when that truck is loaded, it feels a lot different than that. It is scary. There's a lot of stuff to do on land as well. Or I was back on the on the dump. Now that dump job should have been posted. It never was. I don't know why it never was, but it never was. So I spent most of my time working down there. So the training I got working for that company was unbelievable. I always said if I would have had even five or ten years under my belt, it would have been so much easier because then I could have got way more hours. But having you know the months of um, seniority that I had, you know, was was dwarfed by what other people had. You know, I mean, some of these people who were like thirty years old had been there since they were eighteen. They had like twelve years seniority. You know, so anyways. Life is quite different. One night we went to a bingo game. Now I think I played bingo in high school, in, in, in school, stuff like that, you know. I was never much of a bingo player, but I played play before and I understood the, the idea. So I go this, there's a, they had a big hall there. They use that for, you know, union meetings or dances, whatever. So they had a bingo game going on. Places packed. first game and they're calling out the numbers and, and I think holy smokes I think I got a bingo but I was afraid to put my hand up in case I didn't I didn't want to make a fool of myself so I nudged the guy beside me I said I think I got a bingo he goes yeah you put up your hand so I did the guy comes over checks my card he goes yeah we got a bingo everybody applauds and they go oh, wow cool so he goes and gets me a, a, a case of beer Labatt's Blue Canadian beer, a little stubby beer bottles. I thought, wow, that's fantastic. Couldn't believe it. I want a case of beer. So after all the big ones, everybody had a ticket. So they drew this ticket. And it was for a case of whiskey. I can't remember if the case had 12 bottles or 16. So it was a case of whiskey, you know, scotch, rye, gin, vodka, tequila, whatever, right? And I'll never forget the guy that won it. I can't remember his name, but he was from one of the real party bunk houses, you know. It, it was funny. I remember he, 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 drew, he, he looked at it and he goes, oh, he just started freaking out. He's running around. And everybody starts clapping and cheering because it, it couldn't have gone to a better crew. I mean, these guys, they were always drinking a party. And it was, it's like it was meant for them to, to win, you know. So, after I'd been there for a, a bit more than a year, they started building a dry land sort. Rather than having all the, the wood in the water, they're going to have it on dry land. A lot easier to sort that way. Transport it out of there. And uh, onto great big freighters and that sort of thing. And so they started building this dry land sort. And they started by bringing in dump truck after dump truck after dump, dump truck of, of gravel and dirt and kind of filling in, you know, along the water and all that, making this sort of man-made type thing. And this went on for a long time. So I got on one of the crews and we started laying water line, started building uh, these uh, little little sheds and stuff like that. Started building chain link fence. I never built so much chain link fence in all my life. It was me and um, another guy, we had a pickup truck and I come along and we just uh, built this chain link fence. It went on for like, I swear it went on for miles and miles. It was just, it was, it was so nice and relaxing, just working with just the two of us built this chain link fence. The odd time, I 
get called back to go work on a side deal with seven chokers. But for the moment, I stayed down the moving grounds. I liked it down there. It was great. And like I said, when we started building that dry land sword, I learned so much. I, you know, I, I built so many different things. Like, you know, laying this water line. You know, I had not ever laid a water line before. And I doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was, um, I learned how to splice cable, you know. That, that was, um, that's a lost art, let me tell you, the splicing cable. And uh, I got a lot of overtime. There's this one guy's name was Art. Art was not just a jack of all trades, he was a master of all trades. You give this guy a machine that he's never ran before. You give him five minutes and he'd be very comfortable. You give him half an hour and he'd be an expert on it. I remember it didn't matter what kind of machine you can run it better than somebody had been running it for 20 years. He just had that knack, you know. He was very good at what he did. And a heck of a nice guy. They had an old fire truck. It had to be started every week or something by that was the rule. out of wood. I see him on uh, Facebook all the time. Kind of a crafty guy. He was a wonderful man. I learned a lot from that guy. Some people, some of the workers kind of resented him. 
because he was so good at what he did. And that rubbed some people the wrong way. Now, working in the woods can be very dangerous. big on safety. There's always a safety officer coming around to visit the site, asking you questions, giving you advice. Always safety meetings. They were huge on safety. There was a, one young fella who was working on Ron's crew. After me, he was a seasoned logger. He got severely injured. He got hit by a log. He was just swinging around. He got hit by it. You know, when the choker picks those logs up, they're just swinging every which way. They're just, they're flying, you know. And he didn't get away fast enough for the thing. Just kind of, sometimes he could kind of jam under another log. And when finally breaks through, it kind of, you know, sort of jumps, you know. And I think something like that happened. He got hit by it. And man, he was really messed up. I mean, he never worked again. I think he had some brain damage from the head injury. And he lived, but he, uh, he was disabled after that. And there's a, another young fellow. Um, oh, I, you know, I can't remember his name. Anyways, I got to know him a little bit, but he was very good friends with some of my, some of my friends. And uh, they would always, they worked together. They were, that's what it was. They were always on the same crew, it seems. So they're always working together. And um, he didn't have much of a social life. So, uh, you know, they were, you know, they sort of took him in and he was, you know, partying with them. And they were re recommending, you know, certain al albums to buy, like music. And I remember uh, I was talking to him. He said, yeah, Daryl told me to buy that uh, Night of the Opera by Queen. And he had a whole list of records he had bought and everything. And, you know, he was, he was really fitting in with, with these guys. And I thought, I'm good for you. And he was a little bit older. I guess he was probably uh, 24, 25. Now, I, I know when I say older, that's because we were all 18 or 19 or 20, so he was 25, 26, maybe a bit older. So he was going to train to be a faller. Falling is very dangerous work. You get paid danger pay. Uh, at that time, you did, and you never worked eight hours. You only worked six, but got paid for eight. And you went in, and, uh, you know, like I said, it's it's dangerous work. I mean, all a lot of the work there is dangerous, but this was very dangerous because if, you know, if you're falling trees, you really got to know what you're doing. So he was going to um, learn how to fall trees. I remember uh, I saw him this one day. He was, uh, he was at breakfast time. We're all sitting there eating. I just happened to see him get up and walk over, grab a cup of coffee, and walk back to his table. And uh, that was the last time I saw him. He never came home that day because when he was training to be a faller, uh, they were walking along and they had to go underneath what was called a widow maker. It was a big log that had been lying across this, this rope, this path for, could have been 20, 30 years, you know. It was kind of hooked in a tree, but it was kind of rotted out. And he went underneath there and he had his backpack full of wedges and stuff like that that you need for, for, for falling a tree. And he got, he had his chains on all this equipment, he went underneath and I guess he brushed it or something, but the thing was so rotted out of one end, it just finally just sort of came down instantly. And uh, it, it killed him instantly. It was just unbelievable. I mean, the whole camp was in shock. And like I said, I'll never forget that. That morning, I just just had me sitting there talking. I saw him go up, get his cup of coffee, and come back. I think nothing of it. But, but I remember flashing back to that, that I just saw him that morning, you know. And I, I couldn't believe it. It was just unbelievable. And it was something that was so unforeseen. You couldn't have predicted that, really, you know. Now, maybe somebody should have noticed that the one end of the log was rotted out a bit, but I guess because it had been there for all these years, you know, nobody thought nothing of it. But it was just a total freak accident. So it was very bizarre. But, uh, you know, working in that camp, like I said, I made some great friends. I'm still in contact with a lot of them. I learned a lot. I really learned a lot. Uh, you know, I'll never forget one of my my first first days there when I went to work in the cookhouse. I'm I'm sitting there watching all these guys and this one one lumberjack. He's sitting there. He's, he 
he was a father. He was sitting there. He was eating, eating sausages, and he wouldn't cut a piece off. He'd just take a little sausage and stick it in his mouth, and he'd be chewing away and talking. Just another sausage, whole, whole entire sausage in his mouth, right? It was funny, you know. Um, a lot of these people, they, they have this rough exterior, this rough, gruff exterior, and that was just part of the culture, but they were all, they were all pussycats underneath. You know, they're the, the nicest people I met. Yeah, I remember the, the, the people that screamed and cursed at me. They turned out to be some of my best friends. I worked there. I started at 7.34 an hour. I remember we got a raise. At one point, I was making 8.51. I worked there for just shy of three years. I quit at 9.01. Because we got 50 cents.
was, it was defunct. It was no longer in operation. Now, I know I said that camp had been there in the 40s, but it was under a, a different company. That was before uh, Mac and Blow moved in. Now, a lot of these guys that I worked with, even though McMillan Bloedel was sold in 1999, there were other companies that uh, moved in and just kind of took over, so they continued to work for those companies. So they, like I said, they worked right until they retired, you know, or thereabouts. Now, the last time I was at that camp, in 2016, went camping at Pachita Bay, that's where the West Coast Trail, Port Renfrew and all that, Bamfield. That's where the West Coast Trail starts. Beautiful. Just beautiful water, you know, beautiful beaches. And we camped there. On the way back, we stopped at the Franklin River Camp. And there's nothing there. And the funny thing is, it's completely, everything's gone. You can drive in the driveway, but there's, there's nothing there. No bunkhouses, no... No uh, uh, mechanic building, no, no workshops, no personnel office, no cookhouse. At one point, Linda picks up this little tile and says, look at this. And I said, hey, that's from the swimming pool. So I said, no, the swimming pool was probably right here. And then when I looked around, I realized that's, that's what the swimming pool was. Because they had a beautiful swimming pool. And we found more tiles, so we knew that's what the swimming pool was. I remember, oddly enough, looking up and looking at the, the scenery. And it's funny, the scenery never changes, you know, like the mountain that was there is still there, but everything else is gone. So you look around, the scenery is still the same as it was, because I got to know every mountain, every tree when I worked there. And yet, the camp itself was gone, which is kind of funny. That was the last time I was there. And there was nothing there. Some of those bug houses were moved out. Some that was sold right there, you could buy one for next to like a few hundred bucks or whatever, but you had to dismantle it yourself or deal with it. And some people did that. My, my uh, friend Leslie, he did that. He bought one of the bug houses, completely dismantled it, uh, took all the fixtures out, all the toilets, the, the plumbing, the wiring, all the, the lumber, the insulation, took everything out. I don't know what he did with it, but probably could have built a house with it. There you have it, my friends. So Jimmy McAvoy, Randy Castro, Matix Espinoa, I hope I pronounced your names right. Those are your shout outs. I know I said them at the beginning, but I think I'll say them at the end as well. So I hope you're all doing well. I hope you like this story. I can't thank you enough for your support. I love your comments. I love hearing from you. I hope you're all doing well, my friends. So in the meantime, you take care, stay safe, and 